Good morning. It's June the 28th. It's hard to believe that we're through June. It seems like the last couple of months, while we've had to deal with this COVID thing and, you know, can we go here and can we do that and how many and what, why not and who can and who can't and all of the unanswered questions that everybody thinks they know the answer to, you'd think it would take forever. And maybe it, I'm sure it has for some people, but with us, you know, what we're doing here and, and, and trying to, you know, uh, make the connection through worship and, and through this medium, uh, it seems like we just started a few weeks ago and it's been um, going on almost three months. But we're here and uh, um, we're with you and you're, you're there. And as I said, uh, uh, I've said before, God is with us wherever we are. I know the scripture says where two or more are gathered. Well, there's two or more here because Mr. Bill Sledge is here. And so there's two of us here. And I'm assuming that most, in most of your homes, there's at least two. You may be there by yourself, um, but it uh, doesn't matter. God is still there and we celebrate that. So we're glad that you're sharing this time this morning. And we want to move right into worship now as Justin shares a prelude with us.
Thank you, Justin. Hear now this call to worship. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life, and the life was the light, and I would suggest still is the light of all people. And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. From His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Let us together praise God this day. Will you pray with me? God, who is beyond our reasoning, accept us as we are. Take our faith as it is and move us to higher places. Teach us the truth that we might be able to call on you in truth where you are not just where we want you to be. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus, asking you to bless our worship today. Amen. Good morning. This morning, we're actually going to be talking about obedience. When you all are leaving your home and you're either heading to church or to school or to the store, to wherever you happen to be going, you normally get into a vehicle, a car or a truck or whatever your parents are driving or a school bus, depending on the situation. Now, when those drivers get out on the road, they have to pay attention and they have to follow all the traffic laws. And these are traffic laws like stoplights, obeying stoplights, using your turn signal, um, not passing when you're not supposed to, um, all different sorts of traffic laws that you have to follow. These are put in place to keep you safe. If you follow them, you should be safe if everybody else follows them as well. But the minute you speed or do something you're not supposed to do, the likelihood that you could get into an accident goes up. So you want to do really good and follow these traffic laws to keep you and everyone around you safe. Now, God's the same way. God has told us that if we accept Jesus Christ in our heart, then we turn away from sin and we live that way. We live through Christ and we live through God. That keeps us safe. It keeps us happy. Now, he's given us the Bible that have all the rules and laws. They have the Ten Commandments in there. We need to live by those. But we're still tempted by sin. We're not always obedient to God. Um, and that's one of our words obedience. We need to learn to listen to God and do what he wants us to do and turn away from sin. We are struggling with it each and every day, but as long as we keep God in our heart and we pray and ask for his guidance and ask for him to give us the strength to say no to things like taking your brother or sister's toy or hitting, um, hitting your brother and sister or even not doing what your mom and dad say, all of those things can are disobedient because you're not obeying your parents or um, you're hitting your brothers and sisters or whatever it may be. So just remember to keep God in your heart, pray and talk to him all the time because he'll guide you down the right path and he'll help you turn away from sin and to stay obedient to him. So we're going to pray, but remember, obedience is our word for this week. And I want you to openly talk to God about how to be more obedient to him and how to follow his word and his law. Let's pray. Creator God, thank you so much um, for the laws you've given us. Thank you so much for loving us and wanting us to be safe and to be yours. Help us to remember that you're with us each and every day. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Holly. And thank you, Justin, again, for sharing your gifts in music. Um, our scripture today comes from um, Psalm 13. Uh, I'll be reading that entire psalm. And then from Romans chapter uh, 6, verses 12 to 23. First, from Psalm 13. How long will you forget me, Lord, forever? How long will you hide from me? How long must I worry and feel sad in my heart all day? How long will my enemy win over me? Lord, look at me. Answer me, my God. Tell me, or I will die. Otherwise, my enemy will say, I have won. Those against me will rejoice that I've been defeated. I trust in your love. My heart is happy because you saved me. I sing to the Lord because He has taken care of me. And then in Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 12 through the end of that chapter. Paul writing, So don't let sin control your life here on earth so that you do, so that you do what your sinful self wants to do. Do not offer the parts of your body to serve sin as things to be used in doing evil. Instead, offer yourselves to God as people who have died and now live. Offer the parts of your body to God to be used in doing good. Sin will not be your master because you are not under the law, but under God's grace. So what should we do? Should we sin because we're under grace and not the law? No. No. Surely you know that when you give yourselves like slaves to obey someone, then you are really slaves of that person. The person you obey is your master. You can follow sin, which brings spiritual death, or you can obey God, which makes you right with Him. In the past, you were slaves to sin. Sin controlled you. But thank God, you fully obeyed the things that you were taught, that, were made, that you were made free from sin, and now you are slaves to goodness. I use this example because it's hard for you to understand. In the past, you offered parts of your body to be slaves to sin and evil. You lived only for evil. In the same way, now you must give yourselves to be slaves of goodness. Then you will live only for God. In the past, you were slaves to sin and goodness did not control you. You did evil things and now you are ashamed of them. Those things only bring death. But now, you are free from sin and have become slaves of God. This brings you a life that is only for God, and this gives you a life forever. The payment for sin is death, but God gives us the free gift of life forever in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. the places I was so sure I'd find him I've looked in the pages and I've looked down on my knees I've lifted my eyes in expectation to see the sun still refusing to shine but sometimes he comes in the clouds sometimes his face cannot be found sometimes the sky is dark and gray and some things can only be known sometimes our faith can only grow when we can't see so sometimes he comes in the clouds sometimes i see me a sailor out on the ocean so brave and so sure 
as long as the skies are clear. But when the clouds start to gather, I watch my faith turn to fear. But sometimes he comes in the clouds. Sometimes his faith cannot be found. Sometimes the sky is dark and gray. And some things can only be known. Sometimes our faith can only grow when we can't see. So sometimes he comes in the rain and we question the pain and wonder why God can seem so far away. But time will show us he was right there with us. And sometimes he comes in the clouds. Sometimes his face cannot be found. Sometimes the sky is dark and gray. And some things can only be known. Sometimes our faith can only grow when we can't see. Sometimes he comes in the clouds. Thank you, Collis, for sharing, for being a part of our worship this morning. What would you do? I'm going to sit here because I just, I just want us to have a talk. I feel kind of in my youth, old youth ministry mode, like I used to talk to the kids in my youth group years ago. And we're talking about obedience. How obedient are we? And so I just want us to relax, you know, get another cup of coffee, Another Danish, you probably don't need another one, but get one anyway, or donut. And let's just, let's just relax and, and talk about this thing about obedience. We don't like it because it tends to connote negativity in our life, in our hearts, in our minds, our feelings. We feel like we're constrained and somebody's trying to put limits on what we do. But we've grown up like that, or at least we should have. I know I did. I know there were Sundays when my dad was sitting up on a platform on Sunday, and he told me, he said, if I have to come off that platform with you, you're going to wish I hadn't. And so my dad had this look, you know, I could be sitting out in the congregation, and I'd be messing around with one of my buddies or something, and, and, and I'd, look, I'd just glance down at my dad on the platform, and he'd be doing this right here. And I knew when he leaned forward, and kind of turned his head, I'd better tighten up because I was going to be in trouble after church. So sometimes it takes a little negative reinforcement to make us obey, doesn't it? But imagine if you could start all over. A new beginning. No debt, no unhealthy baggage to carry around. No bad choices or decisions. All of those are gone. All the consequences of them are gone. You have all the resources you need to accomplish anything you want. Think about that for a minute. I got great news for you. You can have that. You can have that. It comes from the new life that Jesus Christ gives us, that Paul, that I just read about. Leaving the sin, being slaves and in bondage to sin, to being slaves to goodness. But it takes obe obedience to do it. And that's the spoiler. 
We have the choice. We can obey or we can choose not to obey. It's up to us. There's a story about a man named Christian Herter who was a governor of Massachusetts from 1953 to 1957. And he was running for re-election. Now, I didn't research it, but assuming these dates are correct and it's a four-year term, he obviously didn't win a second term. But that's neither here nor there. He was out and about, you know, stumping for his campaign and trying to uh, win over voters. And one day, after a, a busy morning of, of meeting people and shaking hands, he was hungry, he had, he, had no, he had no lunch, and he noticed there was a church having a barbecue lunch. And so he thought he'd stop. So he went over, got in the serving line, held his plate out to a lady that was serving the chicken. And she put chicken on his plate and then turned to the next person. Well, the governor said, excuse me, do you mind if I have another piece of chicken? Sorry, the woman told him, I'm supposed to give one piece of chicken to each person. But I'm starved, said the governor. Sorry, only one per customer. Well, the governor Herder was, was, was a mild-mannered person. He wasn't, he's unassuming. He was modest. He wasn't one to throw around his weight, you know, well, I'm the governor kind of thing, like a lot of politicians do. Uh, those of you who are politicians that are listening um, are accepted from this. You know, you know, I know you don't do that. But he decided he'd throw his weight around a little bit. He said, Madam, do you know who I am? I'm the governor of this state. Well, without blinking an eye or flinching in the least... The lady said, do you know who I am? I'm the lady in charge of the chicken. Move along. <laughs> the server in that illustration was obedient to her instructions that she was given relative to the disbursement of barbecue chicken. But how, how obedient are we relative to what the scriptures tell us? Let me enter what I'm going to call here for a minute, the Baptist confessional. Do I totally obey everything in the Scripture all the time? No, I don't. Now, don't look bad on me. You don't either. <laughs> Do I make an honest effort, though? Absolutely. So how do I measure my success as to whether I'm obeying or not? Well... That's pretty easy. I flip over to uh, Galatians chapter 5, and here's the thermometer. Here's the, here's the gauge that I use. But the Spirit produces the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There is no law that says these things are wrong. That's my gauge. That's how I know. The important point I'm trying to make here is I try to be obedient. But as hard as I try, I still fail. And with those failures comes confession and requests for forgiveness every night before I go to sleep. One of my favorite parables in, in the New Testament that Jesus told is found in Luke chapter 15, and it's the third of the lost parables, and it's about, of course, the prodigal son. And you know the story too well. A young man goes to his father. He begs for his portion of the inheritance. The father gives it to him. He takes off. Um, uh, now, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of other stuff in here in the story about how it was not it was against custom for the younger son to do that and all that comes with that. We're not going to get into that. That's not the that's not important as it relates to this story and our subject. He takes the money, he goes, he lives wild, he goes crazy, he spends it all, no boundaries, no rules, no, nobody watching, no, no supervision. And he finds himself in a hog pen, eating the slop and the corn husks of a hog. Now, I've shared this, and you all know this. I have driven, when, when my son lived in Wilmington, Edwin and I have come back from Wilmington, in the dusk of a humid evening. And please, if you have relatives in Duplin County, I'm not being ugly, I'm being real. It seems like as soon as I enter the Duplin County line, I smell hogs until I get to Kinston, um, especially on a day like that. I've gotten behind hog trucks as they've come through Farmville, going out 264, 
up toward Virginia, I assume, Smithfield. There is nothing that smells any worse to me than a hog and a hog pen. This young man was in there eating the slop uh, so he'd have a place to stay. And he comes to himself. Scripture phrases that a lot of different ways. He comes to his senses, he comes to himself. And he realizes that living at home wasn't so bad after all. So he packs up his stuff, whatever he had left, and he goes home and there's his father waiting for him at the top of the hill. He sees him coming from a far away. He runs to meet him. He embraces him. He hugs him. He takes him back. He tells the servants to clean him up, put the best robe, and put a ring on his finger. They're having a big party. The elder brother gets mad because he hung around all the time. And again, that's another story. But the point is, he got himself out of the hog pen. Here's what I want to share with you. Very personal. I've been doing this in some form since 1973. I grew up in the home of a staff minister all my life. From 19, my dad went to his first church as a minister of music in 1957 in Portsmouth, Virginia. I was three years old, four years old. I've been, I've lived in the church. I grew up in the church tradition. I've watched and observed people in the congregations that my dad served. I've listened to things they said. I've watched how they behaved and what they did and how they reacted to things. And after 45 years or so of this and being reared in the church, it seems to me that many, if not most, perfection Christians are content to stay in the hog pen. We're content to stay in there. We like the smell. They stay there spiritually when it comes to act because, instead of actually living a life of obedience because it seems to be easier. Ah, it's just, I'm not, I can't do all that stuff. I can't, I can't do that. Does that sound kind of harsh or maybe too harsh? Well, let's do a self check. Let's just see where we are. We're going to use the same self check I use from Galatians. So here we go. Love. Is your love selective and all, or all-encompassing? Loving even those who don't believe, think, act, say, do the, like you think they should do. I shared with the deacons the other night that we have made ugly and hateful behavior of all ethnic, political, and economic populations socially and culturally acceptable and full of double, double standards. And... I can't help but believe through observation that many times Christians are not exempt and in some cases lead the way in that. Gandhi said, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. This is the fruit upon which all the others that Paul writes to the Galatians is built. For if there is no love, there is nothing. Hence Jesus mentioning it as the greatest commandment. We just don't seem to get it. We don't get it. You may not like me, but you have to love me. Because if you're a Christian, I'm one of your relatives. And you can pick your friends, but you're stuck with your family. You have to love me, like it or not. But you see, it goes further than that. We're called to love our neighbor. The Samaritan helped the man on the side of the road. The Samaritans were despised. Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well. He didn't call her names. He didn't refuse to talk to her because she was an illegal immigrant or she believed different than him. He asked her for some water. And then he shared with her the difference between physical water and living spiritual water. Changed her life forever. That's what love does. And that's what we're called to be about. All right, love. Next one is joy. And I would suggest that you go back and see love. Do we display inner joy resulting from our relationship to Christ during the good and the bad? Do we? Or do we sit around and mope and complain? Joy. We've talked about the difference between joy and happiness. Happiness is temporary. It's, oh, I got this for Christmas, and I'm just so happy for 10 minutes until I open something else, and then I'm happy there again. And then when it's all over with, I'm not happy anymore. Joy is being happy when you get that gift for Christmas that you really didn't want, but you're thankful that you got something from the person who loves you. 
That's what joy does. You see the difference? Joy is a characteristic that God gives us, and it doesn't change with the life circumstances that we encounter. Joy. Next, peace. Again, see love. Why do we feel we need to pick fights with those we think are wrong? Do we ever stop to think that we might be the ones that are wrong? Or not correct in our thinking? Peace. Patience. (laughs) Again, see love and peace. Just relax. Relax and enjoy the moment. People have told me I have a lot of patience. I've noticed lately, though, as I've gotten older, there's some things that I really, I really don't have a lot of patience for. I don't have, I lose patience quickly when I'm in a room with people that are loud. Um, I, I like, I like, I like serenity, quiet. I like music, quiet music playing. If you ever come in my office, you'll hear the classical station from Wake Forest on my laptop on my computer. I've just, I've gotten that way as I've gotten older. Now, when I was in youth ministry, I was crazy. I mean, everything was, Whoa. and the patience I struggled with was the teenagers that, you know, tend to drive you nuts, but you love them anyway. What about you? Just relax and enjoy the music. Even the parts, even when you're making something and the parts don't fit or you're short uh, a, a, a bolt and a nut, or if you're waiting for someone or something, just take a breath and realize God's given you that moment of life. You can frustrate it away or you can just sit there and while you're waiting for somebody that's late, just relax. Enjoy the moment. Patience. Kindness. Again, love and peace. For you see, kindness costs you nothing. It costs you absolutely zero to be kind to somebody. So why aren't we kind to people, Christian brother and sister? Goodness. See love and kindness. The quality of being morally good and virtuous. Just being a good person. Just being good. We've uh, glamorized being bad. Being uh, discourteous and uh, morally questionable. And, uh, you know, somehow we've, we've, our culture has uh, created a monster in that. And we, we tend to almost idolize people that are basically lack goodness about them. Next, faithfulness. Again, love and kindness. Being authentic. Being consistent. Setting the right example. Having integrity. Doing and following what God tells us to do. Obeying Him. Being faithful to Him because He is faithful to us. We in turn, Paul is telling us, should exhibit faithfulness to one another. Gentleness. You guessed it. See, love and kindness. Love yields gentleness. The quality of being kind, being tender, being mild-mannered, having a softness in your action or effect of what you do, the absence of arrogance and pride. But here again, we glamorize that. We, you know, gentleness is something we, we think it's weak. We think it... It shows that we're not a strong person. Sometimes the strongest person in the world in your life is the one that's the most gentle. Did you ever realize that? Lastly, self-control. See love and patience. The ability to control one's emotions and desires or the expression of them in one's behavior, especially in difficult situations. Do you lose control when you get in a situation that you can't handle? Do you fly off the handle? Do you throw things? You know one of the neatest places to be to see this sometimes is a golf course. There's no telling how many golf clubs you could retrieve out of ponds in the golf courses across America. Some intact, some broken in the shaft and then pitched. Self-control. There's a story that Jack Nicholas tells of when he was a child and was just taking up golf. He got mad one day with he was playing with his father and threw his golf club. And his, he told, and his father told him this. The ne- if you ever do that again, 
I will never take you to play golf again. Obviously, Jack Nicholas never threw another club, at least not around his dad. And I remember telling that to my son, too, when he first started playing. That if he ever threw a club because he got mad, I'd never take him again. Self-control is hard. It's hard. But nobody said these were easy, did they? Paul didn't say they were easy. But we have been programmed and uh, taught to be self-sufficient. We don't rely on anybody else. And I rem- one, one specific uh, piece of literature I remember in high school, and I may have shared this before in a different context here, I can't recall, but when I was in high school, and I don't remember from my junior or senior year, I had to memorize uh, the poem by William Ernest Henley called Invictus. Had to rem- memorize Invictus. You remember it? Here's how it goes. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced or cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms the horror of the shade, death. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charred with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And that final stanza, I believe, is the root of our obedience problem. It matters not how straight the gate, how charred with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. When we feel that way, we don't need to obey anybody. We don't think we have to obey anybody. We thumb our nose and laugh at what he, at, at, at these circumstances that uh, he's telling us to do that. The death, the beating up, the wrath, the tears. He's just not afraid. I can stand up to any of that. When we have that kind of attitude and arrogance, we don't think about obeying anybody but, our own, but, our, but ourselves. Doing what we want because we are the captain of our soul. If we admit, if we follow this philosophy. Being Christians, Jesus teaches a whole different a whole different attitude. Verse 13 of the Roman text, Do not offer any parts of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. In other words, let Him be the captain of your soul. So the question is twofold. First of all, Are we offering parts of ourselves to sin as instruments of wickedness, living out of a sense of pride and arrogance that Henley is writing about, or are we giving ourselves over to Jesus Christ to exemplify possession as it is seen in the fruits of the Spirit that we possess and should share in our daily living? And that takes us back to the original question that I posed at the outset. How obedient are we? Amen. I hope that you'll take these thoughts and consider them as you work through your final worksheet. Uh, There will not be one for next week. On the 12th, we will be back here for a service just for the uh, graduates and their families. And uh, uh, we will... Strongly encourage you to wear masks, given the governor's request uh, as of um, uh, this week. On the 19th, we will be back, and uh, uh, for our regular time of worship, we will have limited seating in here. And I want to stress to those of our older adults, do not feel you need to come here. We have worshiped together this way for several weeks. God can speak to you through this medium. I know you want to see people. I know you want to engage with people. 
But the thing is, you can't, even if you're here, because we will be, we will be adhering to social distancing. You will be escorted in and escorted out. And, you know, what, what happens in the parking lot is up to you. But as long as you're in the building, we're going to be following the guidelines set forth in the precautions and the procedures that were mailed to you uh, a week or so ago. So we're not trying to be hard. We're trying to be cautious and safe because our responsibility is you. And uh, we want to do all we can to make it safe for you. So if, if you still aren't comfortable, stay home. Watch it on, when it's broadcast. We, our goal is to live stream it on um, Facebook and YouTube. It will at least, if you can't get that at the time, it will at least be on the church's website uh, by that afternoon. So uh, you'll be able to, um, uh, to see it later in that day or on uh, Monday uh, by going to the church's website. And we'll explain how to do that um, as we get closer to the, to the 19th. Again, thank you for sharing with me this morning. And I pray God will bless you. I pray that you will consider this thing of obedience and, and gauge, gauge your ability to obey the Lord by how involved you are with the fruits of the Spirit and what impact they make on your life. I want to thank Justin and Holly and Collis for sharing today. And um, we will now go in peace as I share this benediction with us from 1 Peter chapter 4. God has given each of you some special abilities. Be sure to use them to help each other, passing on to others God's many kinds of blessings. You are called to preach? Then preach as though God Himself were speaking through you. Are you called to help others? Do it with the strength and energy that God supplies so that God will be glorified through Jesus Christ. Love one another. Be patient with one another. Practice self-control, faithfulness, gentleness. The rest as you go about your week. And in doing so, you bring glory to God and you receive the power from Him to be His hands and feet. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. And we'll look forward to sharing again uh, next Sunday and on Wednesday. Take care. Bye.